Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing all right today. It's Monday, October 19th, 2020, and we are still working our way through the book of Revelation, and we are ready for Revelation chapter 16 today. Revelation chapter 16. Good morning, Lyle. Hope you're doing well. Let me pull up the outline here. So you can see what we're looking at. Roger and Anita, good morning. Hope you're doing well up in Ohio. All right, Revelation chapter 16. So just a quick review real quick of a few things. A quick review real quick. I guess that means it better be quick. All right, chapter 13, we talked about the fact that Satan had two allies. Government, and I, would, I guess I would say government force or government coercion. Uh, and then also the ally of false religion. We talked in chapter 14 that the Lamb and his 144,000 are reassured that Babylon would fall. And of course, contextually, we understand that Babylon is talking about the Roman Empire. Chapter 15 shows us the picture of the victorious saints and the fact that they were singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the victory song. So chapter 16 is a another vision that John sees. Now it begins, as you start reading about the bowls of wrath. Now this message comes from the seven angels. Um, so these bowls of wrath are, the source is God. Uh, pour out the bowls of wrath, of the wrath of God. So we talked about the sevens throughout the book of Revelation. So I've got them written here in the margin of my Bible. Seven, char seven stars, seven churches, seven spirits, seven lampstands, angels, seals, trumpets, horses, eyes, thunders, heads, crowns, last plagues, and now we have the seven bowls. Again, don't miss the forest for the trees. We understand the symbolic nature of the book here. So let's talk about Revelation chapter 16. We, we're going to divide this chapter up into a few different points because these bowls of wrath, the, and again, the wrath of God, verse 1, are poured out on different parts of um, they're pictured as being poured out on different parts of creation. The first four bowls, uh, bowls one through four, are poured out on parts of nature, and then verses five, or I'm sorry, bowls five through seven, are poured out on the dragon, the beast, and the throne. So, just in, important to notice those distinctions. <clears throat> and I think, and so this is the first thing I have in your outline here, uh, verses five through seven. Uh, these verses are key to understanding this chapter and what we're dealing with here. God's wrath is going to be poured out, and it's complete. Again, the number seven. It's full. It's divine. Why? So we're going to read verses five through seven first, and then we'll get back in the textual order. And I heard the angels of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. Now that's the key to understanding chapter 16. God's judgment. You have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. That If, if we miss that part of Revelation chapter 16, we're going to miss all of Revelation chapter 16. And again, this is the overarching theme of Revelation. God is going to vindicate, vindicate His cause. His cause is not going to be defeated, even though at times it feels like it may be. So I see a bunch of folks joining on and greeting Good morning, everybody. I've already talked to a couple of you, but the Paces, Sheila Cole, uh, Werner Louderback, Danny Merritt, Brian Terry, Connie Barden. Glad to see all of you on here today. Hope you're doing well. God's judgment is coming to pass. So these first four bowls are poured out on, for instance, verse 2. Uh, the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men, now, this is key, too, who had the mark of the beast and those who worship the image. One thing you will notice throughout Revelation chapter 16 and is, is that all of these bowls of the wrath of God are poured out on people who have the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. So this judgment, then, is coming not against God's people, but against the unredeemed world. All right? We've got to understand that. God's people are not impacted by this judgment. So verse 2 uh, reveals that for us. Verse 3, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. 
Now, the sea is talked about throughout the book of Revelation, and I actually have it here. A couple of references in your outline. Uh, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8, Revelation 13 and verse 1. Um, and we see this, this concept of the sea being used in the prophets, talking about the, if you will, the sea of humankind, the sea of humanity. So this, sea, uh, this bowl is poured out on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The concept here that a lot of people are looking at or believing that part of God's wrath, part of God's judgment is societal decay. And you look at the history of nations throughout the, you know, throughout the history of the world, and societal decay is a very common occurrence for a nation that is going to fall. And again, we're dealing with uh, Rome here, as she's called Babylon. And it is going to fall in God's judgment. Now, not, again, not the final judgment, not the judgment of the last day, but just like Babylon was judged and the Persians were judged and so on, the nation of Rome is going to be judged too. So this sea here in verse 3, it's what we're dealing with, the sea of mankind in general. The third angel, verse 4, poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Now, that's kind of reminiscent of one of the ten plagues against Egypt. Go back to start reading about Exodus chapter 7, when the rivers, well, when the waters of Egypt were turned into blood. And again, it's, it's with this third angel, this third bowl being poured out, where we are told what all of these things symbolize, what they all mean. And again, it is God's judgment. Again, verse uh, Revelation 16 and verse 5, about halfway down. The one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have judged these things. God is vindicating the cause of his people, and he's judging the evil Roman Empire for their persecution against God's people. And that tells, we're told that in verse 6, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. These, again, are the people, verse 2, who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. All right, these people who are... Uh, who have been overtaken, if you will, by Roman society. They are now being judged. And then verse 7, And I heard another angel, or I'm sorry, And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. God is acting rightly, in other words. When we are told His, right, His judgments are righteous, that's what we're talking about. He is judging rightly. So, then you have the fourth angel, verses 8 and 9, poured out his bowl on the sun. So notice what's been impacted here. The earth, verse 2. The sea, verse 3. The, um, the rivers and springs of water, verse 4. And now you have the sun being affected. Oh, brother, my favorite mother is watching. <laughs> Good morning, Mom. Uh, hope you're doing well. All right, where were we? Verse, verse nine and ten, verses 8 and 9. Then the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fire, I'm sorry, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. In the larger scheme of God's dealing with the Roman Empire and bringing them into judgment, just as he has done every other nation throughout history, and will continue to do, incidentally. God has not stopped being active in the world. We need to understand that. But uh, in the heat of God's judgment, these people should have repented. But instead of repenting, they blaspheme the name of God. I think that's indicative of their heart. You know, the Bible talks to us about men's heart. I think of, I've already mentioned Exodus chapter 7 and the 10 plagues, but... Think about how, uh, how, how many times we're told in that text how Pharaoh continuously hardened his heart even in the face of those judgments that came directly from God through the hand of Moses. So people will react to things differently. Um, and I think in one sense, and I put this in your outline here, verse 9 shows that God in His justice and mercy desires men to repent, but they would not. You know, God's judgment in a sense, can be looked at as an act of mercy and an act of justice. And that should turn people to repentance. I think of Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. The goodness of God leads people to repentance. It's a good thing when God comes in judgment. Now, there may be some harsh consequences to that. There's no question about it. 
but God will always judge rightly. So that's verses, or I'm sorry, that's bowls. I keep saying verses. That's bowls, one through four, poured out on all these different aspects of nature. When God comes in judgment against Rome, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shake the world up, you might say. And we see that here. All right, and then we have bowls five through seven, beginning in verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. So again, we, we understand the broader context here of ultimately judgment against Rome. The throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. All right, so there again, instead of repentance in the face of judgment, instead of repentance in the face of national calamity, people turn further away from God. Uh, you know, our, my response to God lies squarely on my shoulders. <clears throat> you know, I've heard this idea throughout the years of people being pretty upset with with the church and the way things are done and the way things go. I, you know, I've heard over the years, well, my children, my children aren't faithful anymore because the church didn't do enough when they were young. You know, God gets a lot of blame that he doesn't deserve. A lot of things get laid at his feet that are not his fault. So instead of doing what they should do, repenting, again, in the face of this national calamity, God's wrath is being poured out on the throne of the beast. Verse 10, they, they continue, as Pharaoh did, to harden their hearts. Um, again, my reaction to God is squarely upon my shoulders. My reaction to the Word of God and what it says lies squarely on my shoulders. I mean, you think about it. How many times have we heard, you know, talking to someone or sharing a passage of Scripture and telling someone what the Bible says and their response is, well, you can't judge me. That's, that's not what we're doing. Uh, God's Word tells us the truth, and, you know, sharing that information is not an act of judgment on my part. It's just, hey, here's what the Bible says. Now, you're, you're either doing that or you're not. That's, that's on you. That's not on God. All right, so the fifth bowl is poured out on the throne of the beast. The sixth angel poured out his bowl, verse 12, on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. Now, again, this is not a literal event that took place sometime in history where the, the Euphrates River dried up. What does it mean? So that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Again, if, if in the larger context throughout Revelation we're talking about the destruction of Rome, the judgment of Rome from God, this has to mean something. Rome was destroyed from within and from without. So, And again, that, that's the common lot of all nations throughout the history of the world. The enemy, I think, though, here is not some political power. I think it's God, and I think we'll see that with the seventh bowl that's poured out and the battle that's portrayed there. But this barrier, whatever was hindering their final judgment is taken out of the way. The, the river Euphrates is dried up. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of the dragon. You'll notice that the word coming is in italics. So it just says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of the dragon. Well, who's the dragon? We know who that is from chapter 12. That's Satan. He's the source of wickedness. He's the source of political uh, persecution against God's people and things like this. So it comes out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, government, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And again, that takes my mind back to Revelation chapter 13 where Satan has his two allies, government and false religion. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. We're getting ready to talk about something interesting here, the Battle of Armageddon. So then it, we have an interjection, if you will, from Jesus. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. Jesus is coming in judgment. Now, whether this is talking about his judgment against Rome, I, I don't think it is because he's coming as a thief. And you look at passages like 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 2 through 4, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, uh, Mark chapter 13, and so on, Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night. But there were indicators as to Rome's fall. There's a battle that's being waged here. 
they were gathered together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there's a lot of speculation on Armageddon. Some people look at it as a literal, ba literal battle, a physical confrontation that's going to take place sometime in the future before Christ comes back to reign on the earth for a thousand years. So they would take this passage literally. Um, well, that, that kind of contradicts a lot of what we're studying throughout the book of Revelation to take this to some future event that would have no significance to the church of the first century if it were some event that had still not taken place as of yet today. So we know that can't be what it's mean, but it was interesting. I looked up this word Armageddon in a uh, Greek dictionary, and it said this is a famous place in Old Testament history for destruction and slaughter. And in fact, I put some information in your outline here, Megiddo. Uh, Armageddon means hill of Megiddo, and this is actually a region It's about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem, um, kind of close to the Mediterranean Sea, but the hill of Megiddo, you read about it several times in the Old Testament where God's people were in some type of physical confrontation with their enemies. And I put in your outline here Judges 4 and 5, 1 Samuel 31, 2 Kings 9, 2 Chronicles 35. That's Revelation. It's a constant battle between, again, the dragon and the lamb. It's not a physical confrontation. It's kind of like Paul said in Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and uh, uh, well, against principalities and powers and forces of darkness in high places. That's the battle that is being waged here. That's the battle of Armageddon. And you actually read more about it in chapter 19. But this sixth bowl that is poured out, the, the way for the destruction of Rome is, is open. And it's going to happen at the hands of God. So just knowing that background information from your Old Testament about what Megiddo is, the hill of Megiddo, Armageddon, helps us understand that it's a picture of battle. All right? Bowl 7, verses 17 through 21. Now this bowl is poured out into the air. What is the air? You know, if you pour a bowl... If you have a bowl full of something and you pour it out, it doesn't just float around in the air. It goes straight to the ground, doesn't it? Or whatever you're pouring it over. So this air has to mean something. Personally, I think this air is like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. When Paul is talking to the Ephesians about their former life, and he says in Ephesians 2, 2, before they became Christians, they walked according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. Again, this world is his realm of operation, his realm of influence, and so God's wrath is poured out into that realm, into that region of his influence. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. Well, again, all of these bowls represent judgment. It is done. It's complete. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now, the great city, now the great city of, of the book of Revelation is called Babylon, but again, we know it's a reference to Rome. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, we read, what was it, chapters 14 or 15? It was the end of chapter 14 that. When God pours out the wine of His wrath, it says it's unmixed, it's undiluted. He is coming in the fullness of His anger and wrath against this, against this city, again, Rome. Now, you'll notice it was divided into three parts. You might, you might just read Ezekiel chapter 5 on that. Jerusalem was told it would be torn into three parts in God's judgment. I think it's just an indication of complete, uh, full destruction, full judgment coming from God. Uh, then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent was a, a measure of weight. It was about anywhere from our, anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds. I've seen some pretty big hailstones the size of baseballs. In fact, I was in a hailstorm in Middle Tennessee when we lived there. and I don't know how much does baseball weigh, but imagine a hailstone weighing 60 to 100 pounds. Again, this is not a literal event that took place. It's just indicating the, the terrible nature of God's judgment. 
Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And again, so you notice this repetition in the last part here uh, from verse 8 through the end of this chapter. In the face of God's judgment, instead of repenting, they blasphemed God. And again, my reaction to God and His message is it, it's, it's on my shoulders. I can't blame anybody else for how I respond to God. And that's what we see here. So, again, this is uh, not a picture of the final judgment of the world. This is a picture of a national judgment against the great city that would be broken up into three parts, Verse as verse uh, 19 says. And notice also it says, And great Babylon was remembered before God. It's interesting when you look at that word remember, especially in your Old Testament, just for instance, uh, at Noah and his family had been on the ark for about a year or so. And uh, the Bible says that God remembered Noah. I think of Jeremiah 31, verse, I think it's verse 34. It says, Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. That word remember in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word zakar, and it means that God would take action. Okay, so when it says God remembered Noah, it doesn't mean that he forgot about him. It means he, he took action for Noah. The waters began to recede, and they were able to disembark from the, from the ark. When God remembered their sins and iniquities no more, in other words, when he forgives, he's not going to take action against those things anymore. God remembered great Babylon. He's going to take action against her. He's going to judge her. And that's that's Romans chapter, I'm sorry, Romans. That's Revelation chapter 16. These seven bowls of wrath come from God, verse 1. And they have an impact. Um, verses, uh, bowls 1 through 4, all those things of, of nature are talked about. And then bowls 5 through 7, the, the beast and the throne and things like this. God's judgment is going to be complete. Nothing's going to be left out when God comes in judgment against a nation. All right, let me look through the comments here. Mark says, those of Rome must have known of and believed in God in order for them to blaspheme. Well, you think about it. If, if the book of Revelation was written near the end of the first century, uh, so think about this. I think I know which verse I'm talking about. Let me turn over to Colossians chapter 4 real quick. Um, well, that's, uh, that, maybe that's not it. Uh, there's a verse where Paul talks about those in Caesar's household greet you. The gospel had made it throughout the, th throughout the city of Rome. I mean, you read the closing chapter of the book of Acts where Paul is a prisoner in Rome. I'm turning over to Acts chapter 28. Um, he had appealed to Caesar, and so he made his way to Caesar. And it says in Acts 28 and verse 30, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So obviously people in Rome knew God, and therefore they were able to blaspheme him. Uh, Wayne says, like the days of Sodom. Yeah, you, you look at the destruction of Sodom in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Kind of some similar language here at the end of Revelation chapter 16. Can I get your outline? Yes, you can get my outline. And so I'll go ahead and say this about the outline. What I'm using here on the screen is in Microsoft Word format. And there are some things I'm going to correct, like some spacing issues. And I'm going to go back and look through for grammatical issues and spelling issues and things like that. And so when I finish all of that, I'm going to I'm going to make it a PDF so anybody can open it up. But I will go ahead and send this one to you. Just know that it's not going to be in the it's not going to be in the best shape. But uh, once I finish this series, it'll be a lot better. All right, that's all I've got in here. Don't see anything else. I appreciate all of you being on here today. As always, when the live stream is over, you can still access the content, you can still comment and ask questions. Uh, plan is I'll be back here tomorrow at 11 for Revelation chapter 17. So thanks for being on here today, and I will see you on the next video.